Hi, I'm Bart Gelman, and I uh, won't spend a long time introducing our panelists. You've got biographies. Uh, uh, before we start, everyone please take the battery out of your cell phone. Uh, if you have an Apple device, you could just smash it with a hammer. You could do this at home also. Um, if you're uh, tweeting, uh, we have a hashtag, uh, a tracking con. Uh, the last panel uh, focused on primarily on Fourth Amendment, and we will touch on that here for sure as well. Uh, but we're going to begin with uh, a, uh, an explanation uh, from Kevin Bankson of a, a quite complex uh, set of uh, statutory uh, instruments involved in location tracking. Uh, and uh, I'm going to take it to you, Kevin. OK. Um, so hi, I'm Kevin. Uh, and I've been given the task of laying out the sort of basic history and legal, legal framework of the issue of government requests uh, to sell carriers. Uh, I'm a lawyer. I, I'm the free expression director at the Center for Democracy and Technology in DC. Uh, but I used to work the surveillance beat at the Electronic Frontier Foundation until last year. And it's because of that work that uh, Margo and Yale ISP invited me to be here, Margo actually being an EFF alum, and thank you for uh, letting me be here, uh, and walk down memory lane on this issue that I spent uh, a number of years on. Um, walking down memory lane, I in particular am given the opportunity to revisit what is probably my favorite week as a lawyer, uh, or uh, my best week as a lawyer, uh, in December 2010, um, because not only uh, not only is, was it a great week for me, it provides an interesting lens where we can approach the challenges, the unique challenges, of trying to strengthen and clarify the standards when it comes to government access to phone records, cell phone location records, and uh, government tracking of your cell phone in real time. So let's go back in time. Uh, to December 14th, 2010, uh, a Tuesday, a really great Tuesday, because we got a landmark ruling not on cell phone tracking, um, but on email privacy. The Sixth Circuit ruled in line with arguments made in an EFF amicus brief joined by ACLU and CDT, um, held that we have a reasonable expectation of privacy in the email we store in the cloud, um, and, and found that the Stored Communications Act portion of the Electronic Communications Privacy Act, which uh, in certain circumstances allowed warrantless access to email, was unconstitutional. Um, so it was a really great Tuesday, and Tuesdays usually stink at EFF because that's when we have a bunch of like weekly meetings, um, and it's really kind of a drag. Um, but you know, the good times didn't stop because the very next day, bam, Wednesday, another win. This one was related to cell tracking. Um, in the very first appellate case to consider what privacy protections apply to your cell phone location records held by your carrier, um, in a case that Susan Freewald and I uh, both uh, argued during a particularly stressful and snowbound week in Philadelphia uh, in February 2010, um, notably against our very close frenemy, Mark Eckenweiler, formerly of DOJ, who we were hoping was going to be here today but couldn't make it. Um, we, again with our co-amiki ACLU and CDT, won a great victory. Um, in that case, awkwardly titled, in the matter of the application of the USA for an order directing a provider of electronic communication service to disclose records to the government, say that three times fast, the Third Circuit en banc refused to review the panel court decision, uh, which had upheld a decision by a federal magistrate in uh, Pittsburgh, Judge Lenahan. Judge Lenahan had taken uh, the very rare step of rejecting, in a public opinion, a government secret application to obtain cell site location information, or CSLI, as, as, as the wonks sometimes call it, um, CSLI records in a drug investigation without a probable cause warrant. And so, in other words, we learned that day uh, that our victory in front of the Third Circuit would stand. And so another great day. But then the next day, bam, it was just another Thursday. But it's OK, because otherwise it was a really good week. Um, <laughs> so why am I telling you this other than self-congratulation? There is a reason. In fact, there are two. Um, one is a message to the law students in the audience. Um, it is an advertisement for working at places like EFF and CDT and ACLU on these kinds of issues. Because, you know, when you're in nonprofit, you're going to lose a lot. In fact, that's kind of the job description, because if you're not losing, you're not picking your fights right. You're not picking the important cases. But sometimes you're going to win. Sometimes you're going to win big. And it's going to feel really great. It's going to really kick ass. And so, pardon my French, 
But it's kick ass when you win like that, and it was a great week. So the other reason I'm telling you about this is because um, when you compare and contrast these two cases, these two victories, um, they're instructive. They, they, they sort of help give us a lens to understand the challenge that we face on location tracking. So first, the similarities. Um, in both cases, the government sought data, and in Warshock they got it, uh, with something we ECPA geeks call a D order after 18 USC 2703D. Um, it's a court order for getting stored content or records, and it's kind of like a warrant, but unlike a warrant, it doesn't require a showing of probable cause, and instead it requires a showing only that the information sought is uh, relevant and material to an investigation, a lower standard. Um, also in both cases, the government relied, uh, argued that it didn't need a warrant um, based on two key Supreme Court cases from the 70s um, that each held that the respective information in those cases wasn't protected by the Fourth Amendment because we had knowingly exposed it to a third party and therefore had assumed the risk those parties would hand it over. Um, those cases are uh, U.S. v. Miller, which found no reasonable expectation of privacy in bank records, um, and Smith v. Maryland, which found no reasonable expectation of privacy against uh, pen register surveillance of the phone numbers you've dialed. The pen registers came up in the previous uh, session as well. Um, so the difference is, um, well, in Warshock, we had great analogies. Um, first off, we had the analogy to the private content of our phone calls, which is really strongly protected under a couple of, of landmark electronic eavesdropping rulings from the 60s, uh, US v. Katz and, and Burger v. New York. Um, there was also analogy to the privacy of our physical postal mail, uh, analogy to the privacy of the files we keep in our home, or at least did until we had the cloud. We also had a statute that was clear. There is no question that the Stored Communications Act allows the government to get a whole lot of email without a warrant, um, based on some pretty senseless distinctions that are themselves based on the way technology worked in 1986 when the statute was written. Most notably and arbitrarily, the statute uh, requires warrants for email less than 180 days old, but not for email over 180 days old. If you'd like to have a drink after the conference and talk about why that is, I'd be happy to chat with you about it. But in the meantime, you combine that clarity, the clear analogies to previous constitutional precedent and the clear statute, um, and you got something that was further clear, that that statute was unconstitutional, and the court agreed with us. Um, and the DOJ, perhaps uh, scared that they might make their situation worse, didn't even bother to seek en banc review of this opinion, uh, much less go for cert. And since then, this ruling has paid off big time. First off, everyone's requiring warrants now. Google, Microsoft, Yahoo, Facebook, even Twitter, I shouldn't say even, they're great on these issues. Um, they all require the government to come back with a warrant uh, when the government wants to compel the disclosure of stored content. Um, again, and notably, the DOJ hasn't picked this fight in litigation or appealed uh, any, any case like this. Um, they appear to be choosing not to risk another loss. Um, and in the meantime, we're getting a de facto rule of warrants for content across the country. Um, Meanwhile, Warshock also provided a great boost for the Digital Due Process Coalition effort. This is a ECPA reform coalition led by CDT, bringing together pretty much all the orgs and at this point all the big internet companies uh, to modernize ECPA, both on the content issue and the location issue. And so um, Warshock has been a really great boon to uh, the push to codify a strong warrant requirement for content, something that we think might actually knock on wood past this year. Um, the Third Circuit case on cell tracking, on the other hand, didn't give us this kind of clarity, hasn't yielded these kinds of dividends. Instead, we're sort of at a standstill. And there are a few reasons for this. First off, the analogies are much less helpful. Um, it's a lot easier to analogize cell tower records to unprotected dialing information or to bank records than it is to the private contents of your communications. Um, although we did succeed in convincing the court that that was not an apt analogy uh, that because we don't actually knowingly expose or directly communicate our location to our phone company. Um, so there's, the Third Circuit found after we argued, there's no knowing exposure leading to an assumption of the risk in Fourth Amendment terms. Um, second, the decision itself is a lot more cabined and conditional and contingent than the Warshock decision. It didn't hold that the statute or the Fourth Amendment requires a warrant for cell site location information, 
Um, instead, it held that the statute, which is admittedly ambiguous about how it treats location, uh, gave magistrates the discretion to require a warrant in order to avoid the hard Fourth Amendment question, and then hinted that the records might, bo might be protected by the Fourth Amendment if they're precise enough to place you inside of a home, basing this on, on a couple of key uh, location tracking cases from the 80s, Carroll and Knotts. Um, Third, the decision hasn't really given a whole lot of new juice to the DDP push to reform location tracking in ECPA. Um, the content fight is going well, but um, things have been pretty quiet on the location privacy front, even with the help of U.S. v. Jones. Uh, in part, this is because there's, there's still some disagreement about whether warrants are actually the appropriate standard for stored records. Um, some, including Stephanie and Chris uh, Segoyan, have, have argued, at least as a matter of political expediency, that we shouldn't be pushing a, a warrant requirement for stored records, but instead should improve the deorder standard. Um, in part, it's because of vigorous opposition from the DOJ, uh, who at, on this are unburdened by obvious absurdities like a 180-day rule. Um, and in part, it's just because it's a really hard drafting problem. With the content stuff, you can basically just tweak ECPA. With the location stuff, you kind of have to write a whole new statute. So, Fourth and finally, when you're contrasting these cases, there's, unlike with the content stuff, there's no indication that DOJ or the magistrates or the phone companies have really changed what they're doing. It seems like the government is still using deorders for stored records. Uh, the magistrate, uh, the companies are, are still uh, responding to them, and the magistrates are still issuing them, um, with the notable exception of the gentleman to my right, Judge Smith. Um, who in October 2010 denied a couple of deorder applications for 60 days worth of uh, tower location information um, based on the D.C. Circuit decision that was ultimately upheld in Jones, based on the Third Circuit opinion, and based on some really killer findings of fact uh, that were in turn in, uh, uh, based in no small part on a really great bit of testimony by security expert Matt Blaze. You should Google for it. It's a really great piece of work. Um, as was, thank you, Chris, for, for your introduction on the basic tech and accuracy issues. Um, also, unlike the email context, the DOJ is not afraid to appeal its losses. Um, we are awaiting a decision right now from the Fifth Circuit Court of Appeals where Judge Smith's opinions are uh, being reviewed. They were argued uh, in October in New Orleans, once again by EFF, this time uh, uh, my former colleague Hanny Fakori and Susan, again, uh, making an appearance. Um, and arguing that the statute allowed and the Fourth Amendment required Judge Smith to reject those applications. So, just, I have five more minutes, and in that time I'm going to talk about the issue we haven't gotten to yet, which is real-time tracking as opposed to access to records. Um, and this is going to require a little bit more history, going back a little further in time uh, to 2005. And this story also involves Judge Smith, who, as as one will see, has been a troublemaker on these issues uh, in the best way uh, for quite a while. Um, back then, many of us assumed, and we all know how that goes, uh, we assumed that due to the extent the government was tracking cell phones, we, it wasn't really clear that it was a routine investigative technique at that point. We assumed they were getting warrants. Um, we assumed this because no other court order under ECPA seems to fit the bill. Um, so you have wiretap orders, which are real time, but they're only for content, not for lo location information that isn't actually the content of a communication between you and someone else. And uh, there are pen register orders uh, discussed in the previous panel issued under a really low standard. So low, in fact, that uh, Congress in a law called CALEA in the 90s explicitly said, you cannot rely solely on the pen register statute if you want to track location because it's too invasive and the pen register order is too easy to get. Um, and then finally, there's the D order that I mentioned earlier, but that's clearly inapplicable because that's in the Stored Communications Act, and that's about getting access to stored records. Um, but in late 2005, two magistrate judges uh, took the unprecedented step of publishing decisions denying secret government applications uh, to track in real time uh, cell phones without a warrant. And in doing so, to our shock and dismay, they revealed that the government had been routinely and for years obtaining this authority without warrants and instead using D orders, um, which is just crazy because those are for stored records. Uh, but anyway, those two judges were Judge Smith uh, and another judge in New York uh, who was briefed by EFF, Judge Orenstein. Um, so DOJ, once it was caught out using this 
uh, authority that's plainly limited to retrospective historical surveillance to do this prospective real-time surveillance, they shifted their strategy and recharacterized what they'd been doing before and began instead applying uh, not for de-orders alone, but what we are now calling hybrid orders. Um, and this is a never before seen kludge that combines a prospective pen register order uh, with a slightly higher showing required by a D order. Susan, Susan has aptly described this as taking one zero that doesn't authorize cell tracking and another zero that also doesn't authorize cell tracking and then combining them to somehow add up to one that does authorize cell tracking. Um, someone can correct me here, I've been off the beat for a little bit, but there have been somewhere between two and three dozen cases at this point, lower court cases, considering uh, the hybrid theory, and many have accepted it, though most have rejected it, um, sometimes after a briefing from EFF, ACLU, and or CDT, and sometimes in the strongest terms. Here are just a few of the choice adjectives, some of them coming from Judge Smith. Um, contrived, unsupported, misleading, a chimera, a Hail Mary play, perverse. Um, and my favorite, and I'm not sure if this was Judge Smith or not, a statutory Frankenstein that the government has stitched together from ill-fitting parts. That was not mine. That was not <laughs> yours. <laughs> so, but as far as we know at this point, and like with the stored cell site stuff, uh, very little's changed. DOJ still routinely uses these non-probable cause hybrid orders to track cell phones. Magistrates still routinely issue them, and we think that the phone companies routinely accept them. Meanwhile, and, and uh, more like in the email context, the DOJ has refused to appeal any of these uh, cases questioning their hybrid theory, perhaps in recognition of just how weak it is. Um, so we, both the public and the magistrates, are kind of wandering around in the dark on this one, uh, which is basically the theme of an article I wrote for a symposium, symposium of Susan's years ago uh, that recounts the history of this real-time tracking issue and uh, the secrecy that surrounds it and pretty much all other law enforcement legal theories and practices when it comes to electronic surveillance. Um, I'm a little bit embarrassed by it as my, as my first journal uh, effort, but Segoyan tells me it's worth reading and I try to avoid arguing with Chris unless I absolutely have to. So um, in the meantime, and on that note, now that I've explained just uh, what an unholy and depressing mess the state of the law is on these issues, I'll turn it over to my fellow panelists and we can maybe try and make some sense of it and chart a way forward. Thank you, and thanks for keeping your promise exactly on time. Stephanie, uh, w and we're, we're going to change this from sort of uh, long presentations to a more sort of conversational format based on some uh, planted questions by the panelists uh, ahead of time and also some of my follow-ups. Uh, one, one of the things that you've expressed interest in is, is essentially the obfuscation of what the government is doing when it applies for uh, uh, this kind of location data, when it asks for it, that that uh, the implicit requirement is for a magistrate like uh, Judge Smith uh, to have considerable technical knowledge or to go out affirmatively and, and seek it. I explain what's happening there and why that matters. Sure, and let me just start by saying, um, as Kevin gave a little bit of his background and how he came to this issue, I was a federal prosecutor for a number of years and then um, had the good fortune to be detailed to the House Judiciary Committee when the digital due process uh, effort started and the committee started to consider how to reform ECPA. And, um, I will agree with Kevin that the content fix has presented a much clearer path than the location fix. And I became, frankly, more educated from folks like Matt Blaze, who started talking about what this technology does and what it can uh, have the potential to do in the future. And I, I thank Chris because what he explained this morning vis-a-vis single cell tower data and even historical location information about single cell tower data that is the product of a microcell, a picocell, and a femtocell, that that technology can produce extremely precise data. Um, that fact has played, or how you may say, not played into well, to what I would characterize as how DOJ has chosen to litigate these cases and, and even represent to congressional staff about the lay of the land vis-a-vis -vis, um, 
what the standard should be for location data. So let me now directly answer your, your question with that intro. Um, DOJ has taken the position both from a prospective standpoint and with regards to historical location information that the data is very imprecise. And because it is imprecise, they do not need a warrant. Now, they have conceded that when they are getting GPS data and prospectively tracking, they do get a warrant. The problem is, as Matt Blaze testified to the committee about and as Chris aptly summarized this morning, that is not the case for the state of the technology. So that, uh, and I, I know, Judge Smith, I'm not, I'm not gonna force you to talk about the, the Fifth Circuit case, but in that case, um, which was an appeal of three orders that Judge Smith had issued vis-a-vis -vis government requests for historical location data when they just wanted to use a D order, um, Judge Smith denied those requests. He was going to require a warrant. And, and one of the reasonings that it, reasons that he, he relates in his opinion is because of the state of the technology. DOJ, if you read their brief on appeal to the Fifth Circuit, basically represents that in these particular orders, the historical location data is very imprecise. And they um, suggest that, that they put forth an affidavit from Metro PCS, and they suggest that if a court, a magistrate judge like Judge Smith were to hold a hearing on um, the other two orders, that the T-Mobile network information would be equally imprecise. Well, that may be the case in these three particular situations. But the way that DOJ is sort of pushing their litigation and ultimately pushing the law sort of suggests that we are putting magistrates, judges like Judge Smith, in the position of literally having to look at maps of cell towers every time they um, have to determine whether DOJ can get information with a D order, with a hybrid order, or with a higher warrant standard. I respectfully submit to you that, that while our, our, our judges are quite able um, requiring them to look at maps of cell towers where a new femto cell may pop up, as Chris explained, any time someone receives it in the mail is just no way to run a railroad. And it is creating um, a body of law that is just a, 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 a legal landscape that's nothing more than a mess. Well, is it, is it a body of law or is it a body of practice given that uh, there's so little published on this? Well, you're, you're getting various decisions. Um, DOJ relies on one. Most of them right now are magistrate judge decisions. But DOJ, for example, relies on a 2005 decision from Judge Gorenstein to be not Orenstein, not Orenstein, <laughs> but Gorenstein with a G from 2005, where he is literally examining the map of cell towers in, at that time, uh, the particular area of Manhattan, and determining that single cell tower data is not very precise. So Judge Smith, um, in some congressional testimony that he gave, documented, I've, I've lost count as to the number of cases, but um, at least a magistrate magistrate and district judge body of law where these, these decisions are coming out in different ways and um, really cr creating no clear rules for any of the stakeholders at issue here. Um, be them law enforcement, be them judges, be them litigants, be them industry, who um, I know Ed will talk about further, but, but they too, if you want them to push back, they need clear laws to understand. But are, are you saying, and could you document, that uh, the Justice Department in your old, uh, your old uh, shop is, uh, is, is misrepresenting the facts, is, is making knowingly false statements about the technology, uh, that, a, that a magistrate judge would or could find that if, if that person had sort of the unreasonable burden on him or her to look into it? Well, insofar as for example, in the Fifth Circuit case, DOJ is addressing the technology at issue in those very applications. It would be hard to 
say that that was a lie, if, that, if that's what you are really asking. But in what they're telling other magistrates. But, but in, in so far as they may be, for example, representing to congressional staff or relying on opinions that suggests that, that, that networks have a certain level of capacity that is always imprecise, um, yes, I think that that is a bit disingenuous. I've seen them cite FCC studies from 10 years ago about the accuracy of cell tracking. Interesting. I'm going to, I'm going to go now uh, to Judge Smith. And, and don't worry, Ed, I'm coming back to you. Uh, and by the way, uh, his, uh, his colorful writing is not limited to opinions. Uh, he's got uh, two uh, published articles uh, with titles that gagged, sealed, and delivered. The other one is Standing Up for Mr. Nesbitt, which if we have any Monty Python fans here, we'll recognize as the guy who tries to hide behind the bush. Uh, and uh, in any event, uh, I wanted to ask you why it is that there are so few reported decisions on this and whether uh, it, it's possible for anyone outside uh, the Justice Department or, or anyone at all, given that there are other authorities seeking um, the location data to know how, how often it happens and under what pretexts. Yeah, uh, first of all, uh, uh, I wanna make clear that I'm, anything I say, I'm not commenting on the case before the Fifth Circuit or any pending cases, uh, and that's not my, uh, not my concern here, and, nor am I advocating for a particular standard one way or the other. My, Decisions. I mean, I published them for the uh, for the reason that I wanted there to be discussion, and for the appellate courts to tell me, you know, how I got it wrong. So I'm not going to going to deal with those issues here. But but a um, couple of concerns. I mean, Stephanie referred to this body of law that's now out there with regard to uh, tracking, and and it is not really a body of law. There there are a bunch of magistrate judges and a few district judges who have opined on what the standards ought to be. Uh, but right now, there's no appellate guidance as to what the standards really are. So really, we have a situation where each magistrate judge is basically a law unto himself. If they choose to, to agree with me, they can. If they choose to agree with Judge Gorenstein, they can and, and uh, grant the orders. Uh, and, and you don't really know based on I mean, there, as was mentioned, there are probably a couple of dozen decisions published, all in Fed Sub Second, uh, some just on Westlaw that address the topic. But there's no way of knowing who, what the real majority view is. I would say that with regard to prospective tracking, uh, the majority of published decisions require a warrant. But I cannot say that all magistrate judges or the majority of them require a warrant. Those, I mean, frankly, magistrate judges, to speak up for my uh, colleagues, I mean, we're fairly busy people, and we don't have the luxury very often of sitting down and writing an opinion uh, every time one of these things crosses our desk, one of these applications crosses our desk. I mean, we'll get, when I'm on criminal duty, I get two or three of these every day. Uh, they very, could, but very, they, they could be rejecting them without published opinions. Absolutely. Uh, absolutely. But you don't think they are in very large numbers. I, well, don't, I don't. Think so, but but again, you know, nobody really knows because nobody's really done a survey. Now, as your question is why there's so few appeals, uh, but the you know appellate courts cannot decide cases that are not appealed. If there's no appeal filed, there won't be a decision. That's just basic. Uh, and ECPA orders are rarely, if ever, challenged. The only party really in position to appeal is the government because they're the one in possession of the facts and they know what the magistrate judge has done. Uh, and so it, it kind of resolves to that, an old saw that you know, only the party that could appeal won't and only the party that would appeal can't. And the reasons for that are that what I call ECPA's regime of secrecy. And I think there are basically three components to that. One. The first is the gag order, because when we issue these orders, uh, we always uh, uh, require non-disclosure by the provider to the provider's customer. Um, and there are good reasons for that, at least on a temporary basis. I mean, there's no point in getting 
uh, uh, location data, especially if you're tracking somebody uh, on an ongoing investigation, going to tip them off. Well, that's going to blow the investigation. So the good reasons, at least for temporarily keeping uh, the providers from telling the customers that they're getting access. Uh, now, the, the problem is, well, when are they going to learn about it? Well, if, if, the, if the case ultimately ripens to a criminal prosecution and the defendant is charged, then you would think that they would get that information that these orders would be provided to them. Uh, uh, but even, even then, it's not, there's not much the defendant can do because there's no suppression remedy under ECPA. I mean, if the, the violation, assuming there's a violation, rises to the level of constitutional violation, then I guess you know, they, can, they can file a motion to suppress. But again, that's all after the fact. Now, so that's only to people who have been charged with a crime. They might find out about these orders, that the government's looked at your email, your cell phone uh, uh, accounts. If you are a law-abiding citizen and you are not charged with a crime, you will not know. You will never find out, not only because of these gag orders preventing the provider from telling you, but because these orders are concealed from the public, because they are sealed. Uh, and again, for good reason. You don't want to blow a criminal investigation. Um, the, the problem is that they are, as they come to a magistrate judge, they, we seal them for an indefinite period of time. Typically, the language is until further order of the court. Well. As a practical matter, a magistrate judge who issues one of these orders never sees that order or that case again. We just don't. I mean, because no, no defendant has been charged yet. There's no uh, real case going on. And so, you know, things just move on down the line. So, so I uh, have no... Can I, can I interrupt for a second? Are yeah. you, from what you just said a moment ago, are you really willing to stipulate uh, that, uh, and I'm, I'm not a lawyer, so I'm about to start messing up all my, all my legal language, but are, are you willing to accept that uh, in all cases or in general, uh, there are good reasons that the, uh, that the subject of the, uh, of the data request should not know it? I mean, as... Chris, go ahead and put it out. Uh, generally, you, good reasons for them not to know it before the request is executed. I think they they ought to have a right to be advised and given notice sometime after it's executed. In fact, even in the wiretap statute, the uh, uh, even someone who's who's a target of a wiretap is entitled to know about the wiretap within 90 days after the wiretap is completed. Now, as a practical matter, the government can get extensions of that 90-day period. So I don't know in practice you know, how often they do. But I mean, Typically, it, it, you would it, think it, somebody that, that's a target of a wiretap ultimately is going to be charged, and so they're probably going to learn about it. But, but for historical location data, uh, in a case where someone already knows he or she's uh, under investigation, why is that any different from the search warrant that was taped to Chris Segoyan's kitchen table? Um, well, good question. I mean, uh, often the, the, the rationale that's presented to me is that, well, where there are other targets of the investigation, we don't want to tip them off, uh, you know, we don't want to, to make this publicly available uh, because we've got an ongoing investigation. And so, you know, as a practical matter, what I try to do, I, I have resisted issuing indefinite sealing orders for these things. I put a 180-day time limit on it, and then... Uh, ask the government if, to tell me if they still need it sealed beyond that point, if there's still an ongoing investigation, or somebody may be at risk of physical harm, or, or uh, you know, a witness might flee or something of that sort. If they can show something to me, then I will, uh, I will extend it. But ordinarily, um, that's, that's my practice. That is not the general practice. In fact, you know, I did a little research, and we've got in our court uh, pen registers issued back in 1995 that are still sealed. Uh, and I'm quite confident that those criminal investigations are long since right. completed. I think, I think I need to uh, get added to this conversation. Uh, and one reason I'm really glad you're here is that there's sort of no point in having panels all day where no one disagrees with anything. And I'm not uh, assigning you a role to disagree, but, uh, but uh, I'm going to rule out of order for all of us uh, any... Uh, comments that sort of fail to note areas of disagreement. I mean, let's air them here. Uh, one, one thing I'm curious about, and it's based on a, a little experiment I did about a year ago, I, uh, you know, as a reporter, I asked uh, each of the major uh, telecommunications companies and uh, ISPs, you know, going through public affairs, a number of questions, including what their standards were. 
and whether they, uh, since they're not always uh, bound by the, you know, the Sixth Circuit or the Third Circuit opinions we've been talking about, whether they choose that interpretation or uh, the DOJ interpretation when they respond to requests. Um, and a good number of them simply didn't answer at all. And the ones who uh, did answer said, blah, 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 we're not answering. Uh, so lies not to answer. Uh, <laughs> so uh, why shouldn't uh, your clients, if I'll put it that way, uh, feel obliged to tell us what their legal standards are uh, when disclosing our data? OK. Um, I'll, I'll uh, answer that in traditional DC fashion by first not answering it. Um, I, I'm at Sidley Austin, and so if, if it were, um, I'm one of the global coordinators of privacy, data security, information law practice. And really, it is a, a global practice because most of these issues are, in practice, global. When companies are deploying things, it's not just about US law, it's about EU law and other norms. Um, I also should mention that I'm speaking for myself, not for any clients or any carriers. Um, I have ad ad advised carriers in the past, but I, you know, if we're going with Star Wars theme, I don't want the Darth Vader music to. Uh, we'll sound make everyone start. sign a waiver on the way out. Okay. So. Okay. Um, I think that there is a, a real desire on the part of uh, at least telecommunication carriers generally to have um, clarity on these issues. I think they're aligned with the Digital Due Process Coalition. Uh, Several of them are members of that. And um, there is a tremendous amount of kind of retail privacy that goes on. Um, one of the things about being in private practice is uh, you deal with actual operations and you see that most of these processes, when they come in from the courts, uh, go to a series of clerks. And the clerks are processing them, and sometimes it's self-service. Um, and they want a clear rule. The carriers want a clear rule, and they want to comply with that rule. Um, and so I've seen actually some clients say, uh, listen, we're just, it's just too uncertain. Just ask for a warrant on location data. Just because there's too much uncertainty, and if they can't get a warrant, maybe they'll just drop it or push back. Or maybe they'll come back with a warrant, in which case it's fine. Uh, I've seen one, one of the, um, uh, this little cheat sheets, one of the ones I love best, uh, what was the standard for location data? Uh, the means through which government authorities can obtain location data is complicated. It must be evaluated on a case-by-case basis, looking to constitutional privacy rights and some statutes. Right. I'd love to get a copy of that. <laughs> <laughs> You've got a chart right here. It looks, looks really handy. And uh, <laughs> it, it is really handy. Um, and uh, I thought, wow, what if you're the clerk sitting there trying to answer that, that's not a very helpful. It's like, go talk to the lawyers about it. And I think that's how it, it comes to. So maybe when they're not answering the question, they're being honest. But if I could get the mouse for one second, I did want to put some other players on the market here. Because if you're in private practice, I guess we have to, can you escape? I don't think, oh, maybe, yes? Yeah, OK. Can I do the mouse from down here? All right. Because I want to put this, oh, of course we allow. Why not? So we've been focused. I want to talk about location privacy and put everyone else out. Because if you didn't take his guidance and destroy your iPhone, you'll see that there's two little things. It says I've got three bars. And then there's another thing, the Wi-Fi signal, right? And the Wi-Fi location is even much tighter. It's not some femtocells cells might be a little bit closer. But the, the Wi-Fi signal is as important. And internet companies gathering location information can be as significant a source of information about location. And that's a, the thing is that we're focusing on telecom because there's law there, there's ECPA. But on, for much of the pe money, the people who have location data are not covered by ECPA. People concerned about credit cards, but there's RIFPA there. But we don't have that here. So this is this LumaScape, and this is a, uh, something that's used in the online advertising industry. Uh, this is for mobile. Everyone involved in taking mobile marketing and giving it to a consumer. And you see that the carriers, well, the carriers are up there, but they're a tiny little portion of this. And then there are all these companies down here, location-based service apps, location technology companies. There are all these companies that are out there, and uh, it would be a whole 
uh, seminar to explain how they all interact and is, is quite complex. My point being that there are many other sources of location information that would be available to law enforcement and those sources of location data aren't under the regulatory scheme that the telecom carriers or the credit card companies or the banks are. And so, although you might be interested in how the carriers are responding to it, to my mind, the worrying thing is how the other companies are responding to it because those location-based companies then take that information and one of the main uh, consumers of that information is DHS. It feeds back into the government and that data does not have any process to it. And right. they say, well, why can't we have the same information that some guy trying to sell you a, a serial ad has? So uh, th that's really interesting. And uh, I, I want that seminar on the slide. Uh, <laughs> but I want to press you on, the, uh, on, on part of the original question. Uh, there, there are constitutional, there are statutory, there are regulatory mechanisms that could address these issues. But there are also market mechanisms that could, in theory. Mm -hmm. uh, but we don't have the transparency that would allow that to happen. So Judge Kaczynski can decide how much he's willing to pay for privacy, and, and each of us can do that, but we have no way of shopping for privacy because the, uh, the companies involved uh, won't tell us what their practices are, with, with some exceptions like uh, Google and Twitter. Uh, so uh, sort of as, as good market uh, capitalists, uh, wouldn't, it be, wouldn't it be the right thing for the companies to make more information available about, okay, they, they want clear standards, but what are their practices now? There are efforts, some, and it, it depends on how they want to market themselves. Among the even telecom carriers, which are over there, I know everything's hard to see on that, even among the uh, telcos, there are different, they're much more privacy protective. As I said, one of, one of them just says, get a warrant. It's unclear, just get a warrant. And can and, you say which I mean, one? <laughs> no. They right. should say <laughs> that. People would right. love to that. That's, that's the point. You know, and there's that. Um, there is right now a big experiment on this right now. Microsoft is trying to advertise its privacy protected status. I mean, they're, 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 if, I don't know if you've seen the Don't Get Scroogled campaigns. They are trying to argue that their search results are cleaner, their data handling is better than Google's. And they're trying to sell Microsoft Bing as against Google, which we'll see how much traction that gets. Um, but there are efforts, I mean, companies are trying to do it. The question is, is are consumers, and this goes to the point Judge Kaczynski made, are consumers going to buy it? I mean, what is the price? At, what is the price for privacy? Is it you want to get free, free ads for Starbucks as you're walking by? Well, then they need to know you're walking by Starbucks. Right, well, but I'll, I'll open this up to everybody, but uh, it's true that sometimes, you know, there's, there's uh, I guess it was Bruce Schneier's famous comment that if, uh, if you're not paying for the service, you know, something like Facebook, you're not the customer, you're the product. Uh, and that goes to the subsidy idea, but I'm paying plenty for this, probably $2,000 over the life of the contract, but uh, Verizon Wireless, in my case, you know, figured they're leaving money on the table if they don't also sort of sell me. Uh, and what, one, one of the issues here for the companies is, I mean, the government can ask for all kinds of historical location data, but uh, if the companies didn't keep it, it wouldn't be there. Uh, and the companies keep it for their own commercial reasons, primarily. Uh, so, I mean, do, do you see a conflict of interest between the companies and their customers or, uh, on something like that? I think, the, I mean, I, this is when the carriers signed on to the Digital Due Process Coalition. I think that was a good faith a uh, well-intentioned effort to try to get some clarity. And as much as we are worried about the courts and uh, fighting over it, I think the fight would be much easier if Congress um, um, got onto the field here and we had a senator somewhere who would put a locational bill, a location <laughs> privacy bill for it, um, and, and clarify that. And that I think the carriers would, would go with that. Go ahead. You almost can't throw yourself back. So that don't. would be a great segue to discuss what's happening on the Hill. But before we do that, I just want to talk a little bit more about the transparency issue. Uh -huh. um, because, you know, we do have this uh, great effort from a number of companies to try and be more transparent. We're seeing numbers from, from Google and Twitter. We're seeing from Twitter them starting to be more clear about what their standards are for, for all their data. Google has said what their positions are on some data, as have some other companies that I mentioned. Um, 
And it's worth noting that by disclosing what standards you are holding your company to, you can help establish the norm. You can actually help create the rule when there is not a clear rule that's been established or at least been established for the entire country. And you can help create the norm when you're public about that. But, and then there's simply the issue of numbers. Um, you know, right now we're starting to see more internet companies give numbers voluntarily. When it comes to the carriers, we only got them when, when Mr. Markey and Barton uh, pressed for them. And then we got them back um, very inconsistent with the, one, very large numbers, but also not knowing exactly how they counted certain things so that, like, it's hard to compare one company to another. Finally, there's a third aspect of the transparency that's wholly lacking. Um, and that is clarity on what exactly the records are that are currently being compiled and held. You know, we will very occasionally, and Susan knows this as well as anyone, we'll get like a couple of photocopies of like a sprint record from 2008. And that's shown to us as some evidence of what the state of cell tracking is. And, but we don't honestly know. We don't, you know, we don't have the barest bare facts of what exactly a Verizon or an AT&T or any other carrier or, frankly, anyone else in this ecosystem mm -hmm. is storing on us. And that is a, a real problem. Um, but yeah, so there are some senators who've done that. Uh, it's pretty great. Um, well, so Senator Leahy uh, introduced a bill uh, a couple of years ago at this point um, that both warrant for content and warrant for uh, tracking of a cell phone, but did not... For prospective track, well, tracking, yes. Uh, uh, for tracking of a cell phone, prospective tracking of, uh, uh, of a cell phone, but, but did not introduce a warrant requirement for stored records. Um, uh, a couple of uh, folks saw that bet and raised it. Um, Senator Wyden and Representative Chaffetz, uh, bipartisan team up, um, introduced a bill called the GPS Act that is now also uh, co sponsored or hopefully when it is reintroduced will be co-sponsored uh, by Senator Kirk that would require a uh, warrant for real-time tracking or access to stored records. Um, as I said before, the heat right now is on, is on content. There was a content fix that passed out of the Judiciary Committee um, Senate side uh, last year. We are hoping that will happen again and we're hoping it'll get even farther this year. Um, whether and how location is going to mix with that, uh, we don't yet know. Uh, as I noted, there are a number of difficulties with the location stuff that we don't have with the content fix. Um, but uh, this is not an issue that is going away, and there is broad support from not not only the privacy groups, but also the carriers themselves to get some clarity. Here. Just right. Yeah, one of my uh, concerns about the, the legislative process, which I, you know, great. I, I hope the legislature takes care of it so we don't have to wrestle with it uh, anymore. But I'm concerned that they're legislating on the basis of <clears throat> not very good, uh, if any, empirical data. Because frankly, there's no, what we do as magistrate judges in issuing these orders, especially under 2703D, there's no tracking mechanism. Uh, if you go to our electronic case filing system, if you, even if you have a case number, all you will see is sealed event. Uh, there's no description publicly available as to what type of order was issued, what type of crime they're investigating, what agency uh, requested it, just basic forms of information. And they're not required presently by statute to, uh, uh, Congress doesn't require the courts to report that information. Now, they do require the courts to report data on wiretaps, and uh, I think that the, well, DOJ is supposed to report on pen registers. But on, 20, on the Store Communications Act, there's no requirement that there be any reporting. So I'm concerned, because I didn't know. I, I mean, I, I wrote an article last year partly to, as part of a project to find out how many of these orders we're issuing as magistrate judges. And I came to the conclusion that I, you know, I had to, there wasn't any real, uh, I wasn't equipped to do the actual research myself. I piggybacked off a study of secret cases or sealed cases done by the FJC, the Federal Judicial Center, in 2006. And with a little manipulation and extrapolation, I came to the number of probably uh, 30,000 secret electronic surveillance orders issued by magistrate judges every year. Now, it, 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 if you compare that to what the FISA court does, FISA 
in its entire history since 1979 has issued about 28,000 orders. So as magistrate judges, we preside over the most secret court docket in America, uh, 30 times more secret than FISA. And until we get some way of getting some oxygen in the system, getting some transparency into what we do, I'm concerned that Congress is legislating from a black box. They're legislating based on you know, hearings and, you know, and I was invited to testify and I really appreciated them. Uh, I was honored to, to give my perspective, but I'm concerned that they're legislating without really knowing exactly what we're doing, because we don't know what we're doing, because nobody's tracking it. Yeah, I mean, I'll just add one thing. I mean, we, we agreed not to talk uh, much of it all about the national security side of this uh, on this panel, but except to note, and, and you, you can jump in here if you want, and, and uh, Kevin and Ed were on opposite sides of the AT&T uh, NSA uh, case, which uh, Ed, I noticed that his official biography uh, describes as a uh, as purported class actions related to alleged national security programs. Uh, <laughs> Your defense uh, counsel, come on. <laughs> uh, but I mean, let's also, you can also count um, national security letters uh, uh, on metadata, which um, as opposed to your magistrate estimate, you've got, you know, in, in the six figures, uh, sort of in, in the hundreds of thousands uh, of those, and we know even less about the, uh, you know, sort of FISA and, the, and, and what the Clapper case mentioned briefly as uh, FISA-exempt forms of surveillance uh, right. about which we know. Well, then the we New don't York even know Times, what they're talking about. Yeah, excuse me. The, the New York Times last year reported that they surveyed or based on the information they got from eight different telecoms, I believe, uh, that they issued something like 1.3 million, or had 1.3 million requests every year. Now, it wasn't broken down, so we don't know exactly what type of requests those were, but I think you know, probably my count or my estimate of 30,000, remember, this is back in 2006, and I don't think they've diminished at any point since that time. Also, that just counts federal courts. I don't think the state courts are any less active than federal courts, and probably more so because they do mo the bulk of the criminal justice. Right, system. and just uh, my last intervention on this is uh, it, the, the admirable Google and Twitter transparency reports, um, if you ask them carefully, exclude uh, any requests that are made um, under national security authorities. Oh, yeah. They really should make that clear on the sites. but. Uh, I just want, in terms of adding some, some, getting some oxygen in the room, uh, this points to another issue of transparency with, with the companies and not just the, the telcos, but everyone. Um, these gags are ripe for First Amendment challenge by the companies that are prohibited from speaking, particularly the ones that uh, last forever or until further a unspecified action of the court. I mean, in fact, in part based on um, not only just general prior restraint precedent, but um, some litigation around NSLs. And one thing that would be really good for everyone would be if a couple of companies picked those fights. Um, I'd love to talk to anyone who would like to do that. Um, but we haven't really seen it yet, except so far in the, in the NSL context. But these pen register gags are ridiculous. Bart, can we return back to the legislative process for yes, a minute? Yes, please. Uh, I, I, that, that was going to be the last subject I wanted to cover with you guys, and then we'll open it in a few minutes to the floor. Because I, I think it's important to understand practically how this works. And when Congress holds hearings, it often invites, in the best of circumstances, the various stakeholders who have equities in the issue. Um, Congress, perhaps unlike the courts, has the ability to draw lines in a way that balances those equities in whatever policy direction Congress determines is correct. So in all fairness to Kevin and his, his work on this issue, the privacy community is starting from a position where they want a warrant for all location data, even a single point of his. The privacy community and AT and T. To I'm, be clear, AT and T has, but, but let me just say when when um, people come up and lobby on this issue, at least when I was there, the strongest voices for an all warrant standard were the privacy community. The problem is the privacy community isn't the only stakeholder here. You have law enforcement as well, and they can make a very compelling argument that a warrant standard 
for every type of location data will inhibit investigations at early stages and not allow them to build up to probable cause. Um, they could even make the argument that in certain investigations, they want to rule people out of crimes. That arguably is not a Rule 41 standard where you're, you're, tr you're showing to a court that you have probable cause that what you're about to get is evidence of a crime. That's kind of the opposite of evidence of a crime. Um, Orrin Kerr has raised the issue of when we say probable cause in the location tracking context, Probable cause of what? Is it probable cause that the, that the location data itself is evidence of a crime, or is it something else? A magistrate judge in Baltimore issued an opinion where the government had an arrest warrant for someone, and they wanted to find him. They wanted to ping his cell phone to determine where he was so that that arrest warrant, which was a finding of probable cause, could be executed. This particular magistrate judge read the law to suggest be that because that prospective pinging was not likely to give evidence of the crime that this individual was charged in the arrest warrant, even with a warrant, the government couldn't get it. The probable cause standard didn't fit. So this is a very, as Kevin said, complex issue. And you know, if, if we want to look practically down the road and actually change the law in a way that will help our, our privacy rights, we have to deal with all of the, of the different equities. And, and law enforcement has to compromise too. But I think you know, outside of the courts, if you're looking for Congress to do this, all of the stakeholders have to realize they're not going to get everything they want. But if I could ask this facetiously as, as a way of getting into the prospects for legislation, I mean, I, I take it that you are not especially worried that, you know, Al Franken uh, and the um, EFF, CDT, ACLU juggernaut are going to roll over uh, the national security establishment and the law enforcement establishment uh, and, and, and their overlapping interests with the telcos on this one. I mean, is, is there, I mean, and, and the, the broader question for anyone who wants to answer it is whether there is any plausible counterforce uh, uh, that could, that could al allow for the creation of legislation that would be a meaningful check on uh, this kind of surveillance. A scandal involving a congressperson or a senator <laughs> that implicates their location privacy. That's... Yeah, one thing is that you said the overlapping interest with the telcos. I mean, the telcos, I think, have an overlapping interest with their customers. Because the biggest thing that the telcos um, will benefit from is that people feel comfortable using these devices and find it useful to have the next generation of technologies that Google Maps works because it knows exactly where I am. And the Wi-Fi signal is even better because it pinpoints me even closer. Yeah, but they can... They can uh obtain that kind of uh, customer confidence by making sure the customers don't know how much they're being tracked. I mean, in fact, I, if I recall correctly, when, when uh, Chris uh, recorded and disclosed what uh, Sprint said, uh, was it Sprint or Yahoo that once tried to uh, force you sort of to uh, force you to withdraw uh, what you were saying or, or not publish it because if people knew what they were doing, uh, they would lose confidence in them as a provider? Is there anybody else here in the panel who wants to address this and then we'll go to the floor? I, mean, I wanted to respond to, to what Stephanie said um, because she makes a very important point. Um, it's a tough issue. There are a lot of stakeholders involved. This is one of the reasons why this issue hasn't progressed as much as the content issue. Um, you know, and I also think it is important to recognize and be supportive of the fact that on a privacy issue like this, or you know, in any push for social change, there is going to be a spectrum of groups with a spectrum of strategies uh, and more or less moderate uh, proposals, uh, and that's all to the good and helps ensure the best result. 
I'm just not used to the person who's left flanking me being Chris. Um, but, uh, uh, but, you know, hey, I can get used to it. I, I mean, who's right flanking me? I'm sorry. I totally flubbed the joke. Um, but, uh, but yeah, the, I'm usually, Chris is usually the bomb thrower and I'm the more uh, pragmatic one. But in this one, Chris, Chris and Stephanie together are, are a bit uh, less, less bomb throwy and more pragmatic, which again is good. We need those proposals out there. I do want to respond on the legislative process. If, uh, if you consider the alternative, um, taking it all through the courts, in the Quan oral argument, you know, the, the court struggled. There's a couple of humorous quotes, so I'm, I'll spare that. Um, struggled with paging technology, whether people could leave a message on a pager and such, um, in oral argument. And it was uh, quite disturbing um, as a lawyer who advises technology companies because most of the people in that Lumascape um, have products that are not really understood by most of the people in their companies and investors. I mean, it's, they're, they're, they've got it going and they're gonna see if it gets some traction and maybe a couple of years from now we'll be talking about them or maybe a couple of years they'll wind up in a what they know uh, article. But um, that um, those companies need clear guidance, need to know the rules of the road and to the extent we rely upon courts to give us those rules, we're going to be trailing so far that these companies will be dead before the rules are clear. So we have to go to Congress and we have to use that mechanism because we don't really have any other, other choice to get a, a decent sense of how to protect privacy going forward. So uh, state your name, please. Uh, come to a microphone if you want to uh, ask a question. Chris Segoyan, ACLU. Uh, so last September, when or September or October, when, this, when the General Petraeus scandal blew up, uh, and we, we got these details leaked every day, new details about the investigation through newspapers. The, the method by which the FBI was able to finger the, the identity of the person who was, who was using this, this email account that had been sending threatening emails was fascinating. So Ms. Broadwell at the time was on a book tour, uh, and so she was using Wi-Fi uh, at various hotels. She, the email account that she was using was not registered with her name. Um, and she wasn't even using the Wi-Fi in her room, which might, there may be records linking her room to her, uh, her name. Instead, she was just logging in from the hotel lobby uh, at these various hotels around the country. And the way that the FBI traced the account to her identity was by sending requests to all the hotels that, that had Wi-Fi, where, where, where the person had logged in from, and requesting the full guest list. And with these various hotel guest lists, they then looked for common names and realized that she was the only common name on the various guest lists. Now this technique, in this case, was about hotels, but this is the exact same technique that the government uses to identify people with cell tower dumps, right? Where they get the lists of everyone who's been near a few locations and looks for common names. And in the Broadwell investigation, you had a lot of really innocent people who'd done nothing more than go to a hotel whose, whose names and other information ended up in an FBI database and in the case of cell tower dumps, everyone but the target, the eventual target, is innocent and their name ends up in a government database. From my perspective as a privacy advocate, cell tower dumps are easily the most problematic form of location request. Yet because they are normally about a, a very short period in time, they don't get the same kind of protection that, say, Alito's concurring opinion would lead you to, to believe that location data gets after a certain number of days. What can we do about location data, about large numbers of people? Do you think Congress will, will, will deal with this specific problem? Or do you think that when Congress eventually deals with location data and whether we get a warrant standard or a super D standard, do you think we will get the same standard for one person or a thousand people's data, even though there are special privacy concerns associated with, with tower dumps? And, and if, <clears throat> if anybody wants to address the implications in that question, uh, of the uh, data retention and sharing policies of uh, uh, the U.S. government, especially post 9-11? I mean, if you get a big dump of people who are not involved in the case. Let me know. I'll start. Um, as Chris knows, because we worked on an article together, um, Standards alone are not going to fix the problem, especially with regards to cell tower dumps, because you are getting such a broad swath of information. So there are certainly things Congress could do, 
like requiring minimization. Minimization is uh, something that you find in other federal statutes, like the Wiretap Act, um, like even on the national security side of things in 215 business record orders, where the government and is required to essentially take out of its databases that information which does not support the efforts or, or, or the purposes of which the authority it is given uh, to collect the information is, is necessary on an ongoing basis. So um, Congress could act in this area, but I, I think honestly this is not something the government is going to come and scream, oh, give us more minimization requirements. Um, I think part of the privacy advocacy needs to really um, come forward and say this is as important as standards because standards don't fix the fact in the long run that the government is retaining your data. Um, I, I, there was, and perhaps Ed, you can address this better, this recent decision by DOJ to retain data for five years. Um, yeah, it was the, it was the, the na I think you're referring to the National uh, Counterterrorism Center. And it was a um, really arcane thing. Uh, there was some wonderful journalism uh, kind of explaining its significance, but I don't think it's gotten the press it should have, that the, um, one of the most important things, you've got all these databases across the federal government, right? You've got land records and health records and everything else. And the National Counterterrorism Center has authority to pull those records in and to ping them against their list of bad guys, for want of a better word, and to seize the information about the bad guys. And, the standard had been that they get to hold those records for six months. And this is all explained out. But they've now moved that standard out to five years so that the data can be continually pinged. And so there's this gathering of information across the government. And I think that probably points to, it's something as old as the Privacy Act, really, is restricting systems of records to particular uses. You know, restricting government data to particular uses is a, a, a vital concept here because we need to have that kind of restraint within the executive branch and uh, within law enforcement. And I think this uh, post on 11 idea of fusion centers and bringing everything together and keeping it together is um, something that- And uh, pushing it out to state, local, and on. tribal authorities. Well, exactly. I mean, the fusion brings it all together. And I think that's one of the most, uh, uh, I, that worries me a lot more than cell tower dumps. I think the two kind of combine in a really pernicious way. I mean, we have the problem already even, so first we have the investigative technique of getting a lot of data on a lot of people to try and like cross-reference and find the person we're looking for. Um, the DDP principles try and address this by at least requiring a court order before you do something like that. Um, but other than the cell phone context, we've also seen in a case we handled a DFF, uh, uh, a subpoena uh, for the IP address of every single person who visited a particular political news site on a particular day, which is just insane. Um, then there's the problem, even if you weren't getting these big dumps, of the data they're getting through other authorities, uh, most notably pen registers, all getting fed into the same database. And I'm forgetting the name of this database, and maybe Jennifer can remind me, but I'm trying to remember exactly where I heard about this. But there is an FBI database where all the pen register results go into, and, and so if you've ever communicated with anyone who was pen registered, you know, there is some level of map of your interactions that's sitting in an FBI database right now that we have really no details on. Um, trying to put minimization rules into the statutes is a really uh, important way of addressing that problem, but uh, I'm not sure we're gonna get it. And in the meantime, um, these databases are getting bigger and bigger, um, and we are knowing less and less about what's in them. I'm going to just alternate sides here. I have a couple of questions. First one's for Judge Smith. Um, I'm helping um, some folks pushing for legislation in Texas to require a warrant for tracking, for phone tracking. And one of the provisions in the bill, because right now the orders for mobile tracking devices like in USV Jones are sealed forever um, under the Texas state law. And so we had proposed making it sealed for 180 days and giving them an option to expand it for 180 days. And it turns out um, so far, this has been one of the big points of pushback from law enforcement is that they're saying, well, this is not long enough. We have investigations that go on for years and years investigating the drug cartels or whoever. And I was interested to hear you say that, that you have been saying 180 days, then come back and ask for longer. So I was curious, 
How often are they needing more than 180 days? How long is that in, in empirically? What kind of, what need do they have for that? Um, yeah, that's a good question. I, I started doing that, I guess, sometime in 2007, 2008. And uh, um, actually, I took it on myself. I didn't, I didn't put the burden on the, the uh, U.S. Attorney's Office. I just, every six months or every year, I'd make a list of all the pen registers that I'd issued sealed, and I sent a letter to the U.S. Attorney saying, here are the ones I've sealed. I'm going to unseal them after a certain date unless you tell me. The investigation is still ongoing, or give me a good reason why it needs to be continue to be sealed. Um, and so, since I've been doing that, uh, I would say about about half the time they come back with a request for an extension. Uh, I haven't been. Uh, I would say I, I, I give them a year before I send my letter out. Although I say 180 days, I get around to it after at the close of the year. So typically, my you know, experience. Uh, they want to keep them sealed for a year or so. Beyond that, <clears throat> most of the time the investigation's over with and they don't push back and I just go ahead and unseal them. Okay. So. And my other question was, um, there was a distinction being made and of course you, it's common in these debates about perspective versus historic tracking. But in a context where your smartphone is checking every couple of minutes for your email, is there really a difference um, as a practical matter, if, is, I mean, if, if, isn't it historical if it was two minutes ago? And doesn't that still, I mean, I, maybe I'm not understanding the, the distinction, but is that, um, is that really a meaningful distinction? It's, it's not your misunderstanding. I mean, the distinction between the two is sort of an angels dancing on the head of a pin kind of thing. And the DOJ has, in litigation, sort of argued that, well, we're using these stored authorities because as soon as it hits the server, it's being stored, if only for a few milliseconds. So. Hey, I mean, but I think the main distinction is like we have these statutes that are clearly meant to be ongoing in time in part because they have things like time limits while we have these other authorities that are clearly for like obtaining pre-existing material that don't have those protections. And that's why the government has now created this kludge where they, they say, well, we can take the, you know, prospective protections from Pentrap and then tack that on to this deorder thing. Um, but your point is well taken and not at all your misunderstanding. It's a, it's a, a deep problem. I'm gonna, I'm, I, I, I'll come back to you if there's time, but the, let's, let's keep it, uh, let, let, let me get Alvaro into it. Sure. Um, I wanted to ask a factual question. So Ed, you made the excellent point that it's not just the carriers that are getting location data. Platform companies are, you know, most, the biggest ones are set to by default collect uh, Wi-Fi data, for example, and then retransmit it back to the platform company. Um, every set period of time. Apps obviously uh, um, get location data. Um, there's a wonderful Wall Street Journal report about how you know, one out of every two top apps uh, in December 2010 not only got the data, uh, but then turned around and transmitted it to third parties. And so the, the factual question I have is, you know, what evidence do we have or what do we know about whether law enforcement is querying those databases? Um, we know and we have excellent records, thanks to the work of people in this room, about the carrier stuff, but um, what do we know about law enforcement location requests to platform companies or app companies or any of the other companies in that ecosystem? I would, I would say, I'm not going to answer that directly, but I can say this, that a lot of that goes to building profiles that are mainly assembled for marketing purposes. They want to just sell you clothes and trucks and coffee. Um, but those same profiles are accumulated from different sources in the information ecosystem. And then you see the government having contracts to pull those um, profiles in, to pull that information in. Um, like Axiom is one I think uh, has a pretty significant government contracting section. And so information flows around the marketing ecosystem into Axiom and then flows over. Um, and that's, that's the complexity. And, and so uh, in part I'm saying, hey, lighten up in the carriers. But the, uh, but the other part is saying there's, there's a lot more information out there. And at least the carriers and the banks, there's statutes there. And there's cases. Um, the rest of it is uh, Wild West. Uh, and to some significant degree still. Hi, I have uh, 
two related factual questions. Number one, let's say an assistant United States attorney wants to engage in real-time cell phone tracking and has the misfortune of drawing on a particular day a magistrate judge who does not grant those order unless the government shows probable cause. I'm curious whether anyone knows whether there are policies and procedures in place that would prevent that assistant United States attorney from simply refiling that application the subsequent day when the magistrate judge would no longer be on duty in the hope of securing a different magistrate judge who did not require such a rigorous standard. And second, and relatedly, does anyone have any factual information about the government's, uh, whether the government sometimes files sequential requests for historical cell site information to avoid having to meet a warrant requirement for real-time tracking. All right, I, everybody's looking at me, so I guess oh, yeah. I, I need to answer that question. How do you feel about form shopping? <laughs> <laughs> well, but just yeah, well, that's, well, why well, was, that's why he was laughing. Just the first narrow question: can, uh, uh, Having been denied by uh, Judge Smith, can the government come back the next day to Judge Jones? Uh, I think there's not there's nothing I know of that prevents it, uh, <laughs> other than the potential displeasure of the magistrate judges who find that out and find out that okay, they've gone to another judge on the same application. They turned you down. Why are you coming to me? Uh, there's, there, there's no, I, I don't think the principles of collateral estoppel or res judicata apply. Um, and so they can do that. But typically, and I have been some, con, I have some concern about it. Uh, I don't think it's, that practice is necessarily widespread. Although I will say that uh, as far as the judge shopping problem, I mean, we have five magistrate judges in Houston and we rotate the criminal duty among us. So there's one judge on duty for every two weeks. And basically when we're on duty, that's all we do, that two-week period. And our schedule is mapped out in advance, and the U.S. Attorney's Office knows when I'm going to be on the duty and when the other ones are not. So uh, if you were a prosecutor, uh, what would you do? But wait, if you can, until you know you're going to get uh, somebody based on experience. And, and the prosecutors have no, know the magistrate judges. I mean, I've, I am, I've been on the bench now eight years, almost nine. Uh, three of the other ones in Houston have been on, this is, they're on their third terms, their eight-year terms. So they, they, we all have a track record, so they know. Uh, and so, and, and I've looked at the numbers, and, and uh, my share of pen register applications is, doesn't equal the the <laughs> average it, that you would get if you, you know, if it were completely random. I know that. So. I, I don't think I'm speaking out of school. To say, I, th I think you have some numbers on that. I mean, do you want to uh, at least estimates? Do you want to do you want to share this? Uh, well, the last time I checked, and I, I did it for the last two years, um, I think I, I believe the numbers were I got around eight to ten percent of those applications. <sighs> Whereas you would expect I would have gotten 20 percent, five out of. So you get half as many. I get half as many. Yeah. Somebody tweet that. <laughs> <laughs> well, I mean, is that really a surprise? And, and I'm well, not, not surprised, but and it's I'm not true. sure that's, that there's anything necessarily nefarious about it. It's just common sense, right? If you're if you're a prosecutor. If, if I were a prosecutor, I'd avoid you, you too. <laughs> How about the other part of the question about uh, sequential historical I, requests? I've not not seen that. There's, a, there's probably a fair amount of paperwork involved, uh, so much paperwork involved. I mean, it's, there's a volume aspect to this. I can't see them doing, I mean, you could do, do sequential, sequential. They, the, the judge would finally, I think, come back and say, I would expect, Counsel, you're, you're here for the third day in a row, the same thing. That, would, that question might spring to your mind. Maybe. Yeah. Yeah. But, Martin, but in the Fifth Circuit, we said we can't talk about it. In Judge Smith's case, they filed an application for historical records to be created on an ongoing basis. Just what, just what Kevin was asking about. OK, so we have another. So, apropos question. of the last question, I just can't resist telling us. Oh, I'm sorry, uh, identify yourself, please. Oh, I'm sorry, David Gray. Uh, I can't, uh, I, this is not a new problem, of course, this, in the days before the sentencing guidelines. Um, at least in the Southern District of New York, people used to pile in when the judge for whom I clerk, Charles Haight, who's a proud graduate of this law school, was in part one because he was notoriously light on sentencing. So he had well mo uh, many more um, plea agreements on the days that he was in part one. Uh, but my question actually goes to uh, Kevin on a throwaway um, statement you said at the beginning of your comments, which is that we're not doing our job here unless we lose some cases 
along the way. And we got a very different story a couple weeks ago from Walter Dellinger, who was one of the architects of Jones, who borrowing from Thurgood Marshall said, never, never, never lose. No matter how small you have to go, go there to win. Because when you lose, you're done. When you win small, you survive to fight another day. And in, in thinking about his comments and comparing them to yours, I wonder which of the two strategies is better, particularly if we think that there are radical changes afoot in our conceptualizations of privacy and our conceptualizations of the Fourth Amendment. Because if, if Quine was right, then we have this highly integrated web of beliefs, and we can't change them all at once. We can only change each one of them one at a time. And so if we want to affect the big changes, don't we have to play small ball and never, never, never lose? Um, no. Uh, <laughs> no, I, I, if, 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 you're, if, if you're in the nonprofit space, if you are a civil libertarian you know, as your job, I think you have to be on the vanguard and you have to be making the strongest arguments. And it may take years, it may take decades to actually prevail on those arguments. And so the job is to lose until you win. But for example, um, a recent loss, uh, EFF and ACLU together uh, tried to stop a subpoena to Twitter. Uh, some of you may have heard of this. It was related to WikiLeaks. Uh, we represented Brigitte John's daughter. Uh, um, uh, did I say subpoena? Yes, I'm sorry, the, the D order to, to Twitter. Um, and we made very aggressive Fourth Amendment arguments that uh, the IP address logs, i.e. The, the logs of what IP address the targets were logging into Twitter from, uh, were protected by the Fourth Amendment such that a warrant was required. This is a very aggressive argument, um, but one that is, uh, you know, colorable and, and, and I would say, you know, uh, uh, possibly, probably correct, um, based on the gains that we made in the two cases I talked about earlier. Uh, because we have Warshock saying that just because we have this data in the hands of a third party does not automatically mean we don't have a reasonable expectation of privacy in it. Um, and we have the Third Circuit saying that uh, data that is, that is taken from you, uh, that you are not explicitly uh, communicating uh, is distinguishable from, from Smith and Miller. And so it was through those wins that we could iterate towards a stronger Fourth Amendment argument that we couldn't have made the year prior. Um, and so, and we lost that argument. We may eventually win it, um, but we're never, we're never going to win it if we don't try, sometimes without all the ammunition we'd like to have. Can I flesh out the Walter Dellinger story a little bit sure. more? So it, um, Walter Dellinger was co-counsel on the Jones case, and he is a very distinguished professor from Duke Law School. Um, and I think most of us in the room, I, I certainly didn't know that, um, he did quite a strategic move in terms of driving the Supreme Court's argument in that case. Um, I think Scylla mentioned in her presentation that uh, early on in the government's questioning, Chief Justice Roberts looked at Michael Dreeben, who was the Deputy Solicitor General that morning arguing for the government, and, and says, what, keeps, what in your theory keeps you from putting tracking devices on our cars and tracking us? And all Dreeben at that moment could really respond by saying, is the justices of this court? Um, and <laughs> he went on then to explain that how the court's precedent under knots allows such tracking in, on public thoroughfares. Well, at the time, at least, I think most of us in the audience didn't know that um, Professor Dellinger had done an interview with Nina Totenberg that aired the morning of the Supreme Court argument. And in that interview, he, he put it out there and he said, you know, if, if we don't win this case, it's going to mean that the government can track the Supreme Court justices with these GPS-enabled devices. And ergo, you heard um, from Justice Roberts later that morning uh, a question inspired by Mr. Dellinger's that's, idea. That's awesome. And so that, <laughs> with Kevin is a very good advocate. Just last night I was telling him how impressed I was that he got the Third Circuit to create even a more confusion in the law. <laughs> um, but, um, but, but 
Mr. Dellinger's uh, strategy really, I, I think, spoke volumes. At least so, uh, so NPR, uh, Wall Street Journal, and uh, Time Magazine can be force multipliers for you. Uh, <laughs> but uh, I'm going to try to close this with one last question and see if you each want to address it. Uh, what, what one or two legislative changes, uh, statutory changes, uh, uh, would you most want to see, and in your case, uh, Judge Smith, just as an analytic point, uh, would, would, uh, might address some of the things that you're talking about uh, and, and uh, rank it on a scale from Thurgood Marshall's uh, sure thing to Snowball's chance in hell? <laughs> uh, I, I'm not going to make predictions about what a legislature will do, and, I, and I'm not going to get involved in advocating what the particular substantive standards ought to be, but but from a structural uh, point of view, I think ECPA's a main problem, a big problem with ECPA is the secrecy regime. It, it's set up so that the statute now, it's a complex statute, it rarely gets appellate review, and that's the way our, our process works. I mean, it's supposed to work, that, that when you pass a statute, Every statute has rough edges, has gaps, and they're not discovered until they're litigated. Then, they, then they're then they passed upon by the courts of appeals, ultimately Supreme Court, and then it's a process. And then once the Supreme Court rules and says this is what the statute means, uh, then if the Congress doesn't like that, they change the statute. Uh, so uh, I think there, you know, there are three things I think that would that would aid this. One, I think we need to to limit and actually eliminate the automatic gag order and, and make it the default rule that there not be uh, uh, the gag, or, or at least that there, there be notice given to the subscriber or the actual user of the phone within a reasonable time after the, the order is issued. Uh, secondly, I think we need to, to drastically limit the amount of sealing that's done. In fact, I think most of these applications uh, actually don't really need to be sealed. I mean, they don't, uh, all they need to do is redact the names of the confidential or the uh, information that, that's in there. Uh, but if there needs to be sealing, it needs to be for a limited period of time. Third, I think we need to keep track of what we're doing. And I, I proposed, uh, my idea is we need something similar to a civil cover sheet that we have for civil litigation with, which is the first, if you've ever been, if you're a lawyer and ever filed a case in federal court, you know, one sheet of paper you have to file is a several cover sheet that describes what the case is about, who the parties are, basis of jurisdiction, uh, what type of case it is substantively, and what relief you're asking for. Just eight basic pieces of information. I think we can do the same thing on the warrant side, just a warrant cover sheet. So any, every time an application is made to a magistrate judge, that gets on the system. That's made public. Just who the agency is making the request, what they're asking for, uh, what, what crime they're investigating, what jurisdictional basis they have for the request, uh, if they want it sealed, if they want a delayed notice. Just You can do that on a, on a single sheet of paper, and I think that ought to be uh, replace this sealed event designation on our <clears throat> on our electronic case monitoring uh, files. So, Ed? and I think actually, I think Congress could could legislate that. Courts can do that on their own too, if we want to. But you know, it's it's a process. So we're supposed to stop, but I want each of you to answer that, and then we'll by indulgence of. The so uh, my uh, my three items. One would be the elimination of the special treatment of uh, 180 days. That strikes me as. Um, absurd in this day and age. It was an artifact of the time when um, storage space was awfully expensive and now storage is essentially free. Um, the second one is, mu and that, that could well happen. The, the second one is a much um, bigger ask, is to make all the folks on the, um, the, uh, the, the Lumiscope, the, the PowerPoint I had up there, subject to the same rules so that the carriers and the platform providers and the app providers are subject to the same set of privacy res restrictions and it's against the whole ecosystem so that you don't have this heavily regulated uh, telco carrier dealing with the essentially unregulated internet company. Uh, we should have a similar, you know, a level playing field and then let consumers choose from there. And um, the third thing is some way to accelerate judicial review in this area um, so that we don't have 
Quan coming out and giving us guidance about whether pagers may or may not be a protected privacy interest when no one's using pagers anymore? I'll start with minimization because I, I think as the example given by Chris, these cell tower dumps are becoming more and more useful to law enforcement, that we have to find some way to make sure that innocent third-party data doesn't remain in databases for potentially forever. So um, at some future time that that data isn't used in, in a different crime and that was, and, and therefore um, there was no judicial process um, that allowed for the use of that data in an unrelated investigation. Um, the reporting requirements. I mean, I, I very much take Judge Smith's point that Congress right now is trying to legislate in a space where they don't have a lot of good information. I, I mean, I feel like, unfortunately, if we waited for only reporting requirements before we started on other things, we'll be here five, 10 years from now. Um, but going forward, Congress needs good information so they know in the future when, if at, at any time, the equities need to be rebalanced. Um, and finally, you know, clear rules dealing with law enforcement access to location data, both historical and prospective, that do a fair job of balancing equities and giving us um, better privacy rights. I think those are all fabulous ideas. Uh, I support them all, as well as the digital due process uh, principles that you can find at digitaldueprocess.org. The one thing I'll throw out in addition, um, and this is something I, I proposed in my article for all of ECPA, I think Warren Kerr had proposed this for the content regarding parts of ECPA, and that is a suppression rule such that if you obtain any information in violation of ECPA, that gets thrown out. That would prompt uh, a lot more precedent a lot more facts coming out of the court grappling with those issues um, and would create very strong incentives to actually follow ECPA, uh, three things that we don't really have right now. Thank you all for coming. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.